Good morning, everyone. Before we start the negotiations town hall today, it's been a very difficult week for the flight attendants at American Airlines this week. We've had two of our flight attendants pass away, and we need to extend our condolences to their loved ones and families and all the coworkers that love them. So please just take a moment to remember our flight attendants. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today for the negotiations town hall. This is our first town hall since our sixth, our historic strike authorization vote. And we wanna thank all of you for participating and for telling this company that you are ready for a contract that you deserve, an industry leading contract. And we are getting it done. We are tired of waiting. The flight attendants that are uh, American are tired of waiting for it, and we are going to get this done for you. We're going to walk you through the timeline first, just so everyone can remember when we started these negotiations. It just so happens that we started the negotiations in January of 2019, the last time the American Airlines flight attendants, we had a race here at American. Hard to believe it's almost been five years. They negotiated until March of 2020 and achieved seven tentative agreements in that time frame. Because of COVID, we had to take a pause. And from March of 2020 until August of 21, we paused while we were fighting COVID and why we were fighting for our flight attendants who were out there working during COVID. We resumed negotiations in August of 2021. And we've been at the table ever since, way too long at this point. We requested for mediation uh, back in, I believe it was March of 23, and we started working with the mediators at our sessions in June of this year, and they've been at every session with us since then. After that, after we started those sessions, it became clear to the negotiating team that it was time for a strike authorization vote. That in order for us to get this contract done, we had no choice but to put out a strike authorization vote to our members, and that is what we did. And you, our members answered at very loud and clear to not only the union, to the American Airlines management. And here we are today, October of 23. We are still fighting for a contract. We have passed every section of this contract multiple times back and forth to the, com the company. It is time that we get an agreement for our flight attendants and not just an agreement, an industry leading agreement. And that is what we have been working to do. And we have been working to make sure that we get this agreement done and that we'd wait no longer for this. So just wanted to kind of walk you through that timeline and remind everyone of when these negotiations started and how we got to where we're at today. We also want to remind you that this process that we're doing now is a very different type of negotiations than what we've done in the past. First off, when we came back to the table, in August of 21, we made some decisions with our board, our base presidents, and we decided that this was going to be targeted negotiations. We were only going to be seeking improvements in sections, not rewriting a contract. If we were looking at rewriting a contract, these negotiations would take much longer than where we're at even today. So we targeted the negotiations, we worked with the base presidents, and we made sure that the improvements that we were seeking were what the flight attendants wanted. We also did a survey at that time. We also made decisions with our base presidents that we would do a transparent negotiations, something that we had never done here at APFA before, that our flight attendants would know what we were passing across the table to this company for them, for their work, for their pay, for everything. And we have held 
true to that commitment to all of you. So you have seen everything that has been passed to this company. You have also seen everything that the company has passed back to us. This is not normal in the past here. Um, usually the flight attendants at American only saw the TA once it was agreed to. So there was no, in previous contracts, there was no uh, vision of what was going on at the table at all. What we have learned from that is we are very happy with what we've seen, the engagement from our flight attendants, and they know exactly what is being negotiated for them. We hope that's working for you. I know for this negotiating committee, it's been a commitment. It's been a lot of work, but we're really happy that we have been able to stay true to that commitment. We also have heard quite a bit in since the pilots received uh, their uh, contract, their agreement. Um, we're really happy for our pilots that they have their, their agreement, but we've heard a lot of numbers thrown out there from our flight attendants as far as exactly what our, our pilots received in wage increases. We just kind of wanted to put a slide out there for you so that you can see exactly what the pilots did get in their uh, agreement that now has been passed. Um, and you can see here at data signing, they got a 21% raise. And then in the years following, 5%, 4%, 4%, and 3%. Our starting proposal that we passed to the company was a 35% raise on data signing. 6% after that with every, every raise every year after that. I know most of you, probably all of you have seen what the company passed back. It is not enough. This team knows that it's not enough. They passed back 11% on data signing, and that will not work. And we will continue to negotiate. These are negotiations. So we will continue to negotiate to get the contract, an industry leading contract that you deserve. So we just kind of want to put that out there for you today so that you had all the facts. This negotiations is about facts. And we want to make sure that we give you all the facts and that you know where to go to get the facts. We have a website, we have many hotlines. I think we just put out hotline number 34. And we are going to continue that until we get the contract done. So um, I want to today, part of this process is we want, or part of this town hall is we want to make sure that you're aware of what our next steps are and where we're at today. And we have our lead negotiating attorney, Joe Burns, with us today. Joe is the uh, general counsel for AFA. He has been on loan to us for two years while we have tried to get this industry leading contract because it not it doesn't just affect American Airlines flight attendants, it will affect the industry. And that's why it's so important that we get this done, done right. And so Joe, um, I think we can go over to Joe now. And uh, Joe's gonna talk a little bit about where we're at and also um, the next steps. Hey, hey everybody. Um, so I'm just gonna walk a little bit uh, uh, through the Railway Labor Act and kind of where we're at in the process and what we can expect uh, going uh, forward. And, um, you know, so, you know, as everyone knows, uh, you know, the flight attendants uh, took the strike vote um, and, you know, had resounding support uh, for the for an effort to strike if necessary. And following that, we went back to the bargaining table. The company gave a offer, which, as Julie has indicated, uh, was uh, not sufficient. And I think the resounding message from both your committee and the flight attendants and at large was that uh, not interested in that proposal as a basis and that the company is going to have to do a lot better to reach an agreement. So, um, you know, as everyone should know by now, uh, we're covered under the Railway Labor Act. And the Railway Labor Act uh, provides that we are required to participate in federal mediation 
and are not able to strike until we have been released into a 30-day cooling off period by the federal mediators and then at the end of the federal uh, mediation or the 30-day cooling off period, uh, at that point we would be able to strike and engage in uh, self-help. Uh, now, that's uh, quite different from uh, what you may be following in the news uh, for auto workers and Teamsters and the actors and the writers. Um, they're all able to strike uh, right at the end of the um, contract expiration. So the contract expires, the auto workers are able to uh, go out on strike at, at midnight or beyond. Um, so what that means for us is, is that our contract struggle you know, has a bit of a, you know, sort of strategic and uh, political dimension that, uh, you know, goes beyond uh, folks in other industries um, because we have to be in a position to, you know, get and pressure the federal government to release us to, to strike. So what that means is the standard under the Railway Labor Act is um, that, you know, what the text of the act talks about is that when the mediation board determines that, uh, you know, mediation would no longer, uh, you know, help the process, then they would release us into a 30 day cooling off period. And traditionally, what that means is, is that they make a determination that the party's at impasse, that there's no further movement by either party and they're not going to be able to reach a deal. Um, a couple of rules of thumb that I've, uh, you know, been doing this for a long time and that the board has uh, when they look at uh, whether or not to grant a release is uh, they want to know that the parties have sufficiently narrowed the issues and that you're you, you have a, you know, small enough list of issues that you could settle it during a 30 day cooling off period. You know, you don't have, you know, hundreds of issues out there. Uh, and on the economics, they want to have, uh, you know, some sort of idea that the parties have, you know, narrowed the economic focus in terms of both the number of proposals you have, but the overall uh, value about how far you are apart, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in this case, in the in the billions of dollars. So, um, you know, so that means that our negotiations have to be pretty strategic uh, when we're bargaining. And, you know, I think for that reason, uh, we went back to the bargaining table and the negotiating committee put a lot of work in uh, at our last session uh, and I think really did a great job of, uh, of, uh, uh, of putting the pressure on the company um, because uh, negotiating committee goes in, um, presents the company with uh, uh, all of the non-economic sections uh, of the agreement um, with a comprehensive proposal, full text and really narrowed the issues so that this is an issue that we could say truly is a, a, a strike list or an issue that we could say uh, we could uh, resolve in a 30-day cooling off period. Uh, followed that up uh, with uh, uh, economic uh, uh, proposal on similar basis, um, comprehensive economic proposal on Thursday of our negotiations and place that across the table to the company. And I think when we did it, we were crystal clear to the company that um, the ball's now in your court, that we've we've uh, we've given you our proposal and where we need to be, and now you're going to have to uh, respond to us. And you can respond or not respond, but we are going to move the process forward. And that was crystal clear from our committee. And one more thing, because I think it's appropriate to the you know sort of a uh, uh, you know structure of this uh, call today, is we also that we're not interested in your model of looking at where flight attendant agreements are right now um, and saying, oh, because Delta is right here, that that's the cap for flight attendants. That's not going to work for it because we have United, Alaska, Southwest. We have flight attendants across the industry. We have Delta organizing and everyone is demanding a, a new framework. Uh, that respects flight attendants who flew through COVID, who um, kept these carriers alive through bankruptcies and mergers, and that your, your model does not work. So you, along with the rest of the industry and the rest of management and the CEOs, are going to have to come up with a framework that works for flight attendants and, and, that, and that we are willing to do what it takes uh, to make that happen. And if that means asking for a release and pushing the process forward, um, then that's what's going to happen here. And I think that was, uh, it was 100% clear to management across the table. I just want to make everyone uh, uh, be clear of that. And I think we also uh, 
uh, you know, we're clear. And, you know, I think we got some initial feedback from management that they think that this zip code that they're in is, uh, is appropriate. And, you know, I think we had some sharp words there and we were we were crystal clear. So um, right now, the, the ball is in the company's court. Um, we have negotiations scheduled, I think, for the week of October 8th. Um, and and there are uh, 15th, I think. Um, and they're, and they're going to have to uh, figure out how they want to respond. Uh, and we told them you can do it. You, you can, you know, respond, not respond, whatever you do. We're moving the process forward because flight attendants are tired of waiting. Anyway, so that's, uh, you know, a little bit on the on the uh, uh, process and uh, where we're at right now. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I would say all flight attendants across the industry are tired of waiting. It is time that we get our contracts. All of us, it seems like, have been waiting since before COVID. As we've been talking about this quite a bit, you know, we negotiated wages back in 2014 that we're still living under today. Our last raise was in 2019, way too long. I know we're not the only flight attendants in the industry waiting. And that's why today um, we've asked two other union presidents uh, from Alaska Airlines and United Airlines to be on and to talk with all of you today about where they're at in negotiations. And um, we have first on, we have Jeff Peterson. And Jeff is the, uh, Unite, the union president for Alaska Airlines. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Julia. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, Jeff, how many flight attendants do you represent in Alaska? Uh, about 6,900. All right. Uh, and is Alaska hiring still? We are. All right. Just like the rest of us, right? I think everybody's hiring right now. Um, hey, Jeff, Jeff, can you tell us what the status of negotiations are at Alaska? Sure. So our original amendable date was uh, December 2021. And we extended that by a year due to the pandemic. So that went to December 2022. We went to the table in September last year, so 2022. We were on a very aggressive bargaining schedule where we were meeting with management twice a month through June of this year. Uh, however, their, um, their initial comprehensive compensation package that they passed to us felt very, very short of expectations in June. And so uh, negotiations uh, fell apart and we are no longer on that aggressive schedule. That schedule was set somewhat artificially by management that they wanted to have a deal by by summertime of this year. So that is where we are. And we have gone back to the table now in a regular cadence uh, once per month. OK. And do you mind sharing with us, uh, talking a little bit about your remaining issues and if you're in mediation yet? Sure. Um, so let me cover mediation. We we are technically in mediation. We just applied for that and was uh, we were just uh, given a mediator. And we're waiting to confirm the dates to start with the mediator, but we're hoping that that he will be able to meet with us in November. Meanwhile, we're still negotiating with management. We have uh, still some dates with them through December of this year. So once about once a month through uh, through December. Okay. And then in terms of the open issues, we have, uh, well, their overall comp uh, compensation. So pay rates, rigs, uh, we're looking for pay for all ground time. And just like they're an American, boarding pay is a component of that conversation. So um, pay premiums, uh, scheduling protections for regular operations. That's been a concern for all of us where we've had near meltdowns or actual meltdowns. Uh, schedule flexibility is an issue. Open time trading, uh, reserve day repositioning. Uh, commuter protections, it's very important. Uh, our duty day is open currently and minimum flying requirements to qualify for various benefits, specifically vacation and healthcare, the two biggest ones. Sounds really familiar. Um, hmm. as, you, as you're going through your list, I'm like checking up. Oh yeah, that's us. Oh yeah, that's what we're looking at. So um, sounds like we're all kind of going for the same things uh, for our flight attendants, trying to make some improvements here. Things that we've Indeed. really needed quite a while. 
Um, Jeff, uh, I don't know if you can tell us this or not, um, and I'm okay oh, either way, but are you going to take a strike vote soon if management doesn't meet their promise of industry leading pay, something we've been promised also? <laughs> okay, well, in terms of like taking an actual strike vote, um, we not really at liberty to disclose a specific timeline at the moment, but we are prepared to do whatever it takes uh, and finance are sick of waiting. They are angry. They've been turning out in record numbers at our recent mobilization activities. And uh, now that we've been in negotiations for a whole year, our amendable date has passed by a year now. And uh, with the holidays approaching, it's definitely something that's on the table and we're ready to do whatever it takes, including up to uh, to walking and chaos. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate you being out with us. Please don't leave yet. I'm going to have switch over to Ken Diaz and then we might come back to both of you. So um, thank you again. Uh, it sounds like uh, your what you're fighting for is very similar to what we're fighting for. And I can tell you our flight attendants are definitely angry. They are ready and they're tired of waiting also. Okay, next up we are going to um, have, we have Ken Diaz, who is the union president for United Airlines. Uh, and he's gonna talk a little bit also about his negotiations. And um, Ken, hi, thanks for joining us today. And you're on mute. This is this is our virtual life today, right, Ken? We go through the, I go through the same thing a lot. Let's see if we can hear you. Yeah, Ken, you're still on okay. you. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks okay. for inviting me, Julie. Pleasure there we here. go. Hey, Ken, um, how many flight attendants do you represent at United Airlines? Um, approximately twenty six thousand five hundred at the moment, but we have new hire classes graduating every week. OK, sounds like we're both in the same ballpark here. That's about right where we're at. So we're representing about 20 uh, around exactly the same number um, here at American. Um, Ken, we saw your resolution for expedited negotiations and backing up United flight attendants demands by preparing for a strike if necessary. Are you getting close to mediation? Um, actually, for the last two weeks, I am in talks with upper management about entering into mediation. OK, so All we expect right. that very soon. And what are the key issues your flight attendants are ready to fight for? Well, our contract became amendable in August of 21. Um, we had an early opener that we didn't take because of the pandemic, but we've been in direct negotiations for 21 months with United, and it seems United is of the mindset um, that they started asking for concessions in almost every section of our contract. Well, obviously, um, flight attendants at United are never going to give concessions. Um, we got these airlines through the pandemic. We were the ones on the front line. We've given up the sacrifices over the years, and we're fighting for compensation issues, reserve improvements, quality of work life improvements, benefits, retirement, schedule flexibility, and our flight attendants have never been angrier or more demoralized um, in the 26 years at United, I have never seen the flight attendants as angry as they are right now. They are demanding a contract. So that's why we um, decided and they um, we have 14 local presidents which make up our um, United MEC and I'm the um, spokesman for the union. So we um, approached United after we passed the resolution. Um, to enter into an expedited mediation. And there's been talks um, going on with them for the last two weeks. Hopefully we can clear that up by the end of this week. Um, but our flight attendants are ready um, and, and willing. Uh, they've been on the picket line. We have another picket coming up on October 26th. Um, they're ready to do whatever it takes, including um, leading up to a strike vote and chaos preparations after that. Sounds familiar. Um, Ken, listen, I I know you've had pickets and I really want to take this opportunity to uh, thank not only United Alaska um, for 
participating in our, all of our pickets, uh, every picket that we've had. And I think we're on, we just had number four, if I'm correct, right? Mm -hmm. Number four, we've had so many, we were losing track because um, we are waiting uh, to get, we're trying to get this done, but at every single picket we have had uh, United Alaska and all AFA uh, show up at our picket. So thank you so much for showing up and we will be there at your pickets. We have been there, I know definitely. Uh, we see that across the country now. Everybody's showing up for each other, not just uh, flight attendant unions, pilot unions, but also other industries. Um, so I just yeah. want to make sure I, I get those things into both you guys. It, um, if I, Julie, if I could add one one point why why I think it's so important, um, and, and we really appreciate that you invited us to this call today. Um, solidarity with flight attendants across the industry is the most important weapon we have against these airline management teams. Um, they're for forever comparing us to American, to Delta. Unfortunately, Delta is not unionized, so they set the bar lower for all of us. Um, that's why they need to get unionized. And, and the solidarity and keeping the communication up between our unions and, and other carriers that are going through negotiations, it's paramount that we support each other because your fight is our fight. Our fight is your fight, and all our flight attendants want improvements that they've earned in these contracts, and we're willing to stand with you, and I know you've stood with us, and across the industry, um, now is our time uh, to get what flight attendants truly deserve. 100%. Uh, 100%. We couldn't have said it better. Um, I, I think, do you think the airlines know that we're all working together? <laughs> I, I'm I sure they do, just as they are working together behind the scenes uh, to try to uh, minimize our impact. So, yes, uh, I um, and let me ask you this, Ken: Has United ever brought up negotiations at other airlines to you guys? Oh, they absolutely have. Um, the word American and Delta and other carriers in Alaska are constantly being brought up. Um, they fear that the most because let's face it, our power is in our solidarity and our solidarity is going to get our flight attendants the contract they have earned. You are absolutely correct. And that is why we are going to continue working together until we all get industry leading contracts, um, until we get what we all deserve. And it is going to be a fight. And I think that um, I think we are all up for the fight, especially our flight attendants, um, considering Jeff is talking about the, uh, the flight attendants of Alaska are tired of waiting, they're angry. Ken, you're talking about United. I can tell you here at American, after that strike vote, we had to t our flight attendants were ready to go on strike immediately. They are tired of waiting, they want to, they are done. And um, we are trying to make sure that we make that happen as soon as we possibly can, but we also know it's not going to be easy. I, I have to mention also uh, Southwest Flight attendants are also in negotiations. Uh, they rep represent about 20,000 flight attendants. So we're talking about 80,000 flight attendants across this country right now in negotiations, fighting for contracts that we shouldn't have to fight for. That's what I think today when I sit here and I think about it, they are making us fight for what we deserve. We saved these companies. We all know the work we put into it during uh, PSP to make that happen so we could save these airlines and they surely called on us then to help them make that happen. Yet look at us today fighting to get what we deserve, thinking that they're going to give us raises like they used to in the past when the cost of, of living and inflation has risen as high as it is and run across this country as, has doubled. So it, it is it is time and we're going to do what we have to do to get this done. Well, we put out a hotline this week um, to our flight attendants, and it was hotline number 34, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope we're not at like hotline number. Uh, we want to end these hotlines because we want a contract. Um, but we we told our flight attendants that this is not just about us. This is about all of us, all flight attendants across this country and us working together to make get this done. And I really, really appreciate you guys coming on today. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how we're going to make this happen with all of us together? Yeah, so, you know, and I think you guys have done a good job of hitting on all the, you know, sort of key points here. Um, but I think it's pretty clear um, that any strategy we have going forward um, 
has to be based on an industry wide approach um, for the reasons that uh, you, you know you all talked about about how management uses uh, the different carriers as comparators and they try and as we talked about it with the company try and use a static uh, a static uh, sort of model that that looks at where we're at now and none of the managements really want to jump out ahead. So we're going to have to convince them that they're all going to have to jump out ahead and they're going to have to give the increases to flight attendants across the industry and, and uh, we need a new model. Um, but the other important point is uh, what I touched on earlier is that um, in order to get a, a release to strike um, at any of our carriers, um, we haven't had a uh, we've only had two releases to strike for our airlines in, in the last 15 years since 2006. Um, so it is going to take a political push uh, to uphold our right to strike. And that's something that I don't think any carrier is going to uh, do on their own. Um, but it's going to be uh, something that we're going to all have to uh, work together uh, to uh, accomplish that. So I think we've done like a great job of, you know, talking about that with the flight attendants and, and you know, I think folks have been great about showing up on other picket lines. Um, but I think in the next uh, coming months, uh, that's really going to intensify because everyone's kind of getting to the same place. Thanks, Joe. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I know everybody's busy. Everybody's in negotiations uh, and trying to get their deals done. And I really want to thank you for taking time out today to talk to the American Airlines flight attendants to let them know that we're really all in this together and that really we're all fighting for the same things. So thank you so much um, and uh, we'll see you on the picket line. Thank you, Julie. We're with you. Thanks, Julie. We're with you also. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to our next part of our town hall, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the agreements that we have made uh, throughout the uh, previous two years, uh, most of them recent. Some of them um, we have not talked about in previous town halls before, and we wanted to walk you through those at this point. And so we're going to start with reserve, which has been pretty much our highest priority in this negotiations as far as improving our language and making sure that we had significant improvements in reserve. And Reese is going to talk about that today. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so with reserve, um, one of the first areas that we looked at was standby, and there were two kind of glaring issues that we saw. One is the standby reserve duty limitations, and the other was standby pay and credit. So for standby reserve duty limitations, um, today the on-duty limitations for standby assignments are based on the sequences report time, not on the standbys report time. So we do see early morning standbys who sit for a couple hours and then get assigned an assignment, legal for 13, 15 duty days and up to 15 hours in actual operations, making for a really exhausting day. So our new agreement will limit this. Um, On-duty limitations for standby assignments will now be based on the standby report time, not on the sequence report time. Similarly, with pay and credit for standby, Today, we see instances where standbys are not receiving pay and credit for their time on standby when they're assigned to rolling delays. Going forward, standbys um, will earn pay and credit based on the departure time at the time that the standby is notified of the assignment, not on the originally scheduled departure time. This guarantees pay and credit for all the time that you sat on standby before you got your assignment. And then um, a quick improvement that we have for reserves trading days off with the company is a balloting system. So it'll be a balloting system, a set it and forget it system based on seniority um, that'll allow you to have uh, more flexibility in trading your days off with the company, kind of similar to how TTS works today. Um, so next, so we talked about this one in the past, it's the rescheduling of flex days and golden days. We didn't change the option that reserves have today, which is the option to select a different day off somewhere else in the month with crew schedulings um, approval. 
four to forfeit the day off and just get paid um, the value of the reserve day above guarantee. But what we did secure was the guarantee of the opposite day off at the end of that block of days it, um, off. So without mutual agreement, that'll just be the guaranteed day off and then you can try to get a different day off. So if you are off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, you're flown into your Wednesday, you're guaranteed the Saturday off. But if you want to try for a different day off in the month, go ahead and do that just like you do today. You and crew scheduling aren't able to come to an agreement. You get that Saturday off or you can um, choose to go with the reserve value above guarantee. Reese, I think this is one that we've heard about probably from the start of the implementation of this language. Yes, that our flight attendants have been having to fight with our crew schedulers to get a day, a day off, a yeah. mutual agreed day. So that I'm really happy with this one because this has been a constant complaint. Yes, so and especially with reserve, like so much is unknown on your days on call. So hopefully you can at least now start counting on the days off that you're supposed to have. Um, one of our other goals in reserve overall um, was to improve transparency. And one of the glaring areas where reserves lack transparency is in rota bidding. So we've secured a huge improvement here, which is first that we're going to have um, specific identifiers for standby shifts to allow for specific bidding of standby versus the generic bidding that we have today. And we also have um, more transparent assignment information that'll be available by noon home base time. So well before um, you wrote a runs and well before you have to have your wrote a bids in to give you more information about what standbys are going to be assigned during rota and how many reserves are needed for each wrap. So having this information before you bid in rota will allow you to strategize better and have a better idea of what tomorrow is going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, D. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying I was listening and uh, yes. Uh, next slide, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm really excited about this one. Um, so today on Wrap D, reserves are that overnight shift. Um, they start in the late afternoon. They go till three, four, five in the morning. But unfortunately, our research showed that most of Wrap D is actually assigned to those early morning, three, four, five in the morning flights, the first flights of the day. Um, and they're not being used for overnight flying. So it's really exhausting. They're on call all night and then they're working a full day the following day. So what we did is we secured some new guidelines for how Wrap D um, will go to keep them for that overnight flying. So first, wrap D will be from 1400 to 0200 home base time in every base, and it will be modified to end once all departures are airborne. So reserves on wrap D may not even actually sit the full 12 hours, depending on the flying schedule in your base and what happens if there's actual operations that go wrong or whatever. Um, once everything's airborne, you'll be uh, modified to end for that day. This is a really big improvement. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably one of the things that I think that we've heard so much from our RAPD flight attendants or our reserve flight attendants, mm -hmm. I should say, that when they had RAPD, they were getting the four o'clock and five o'clock in the morning flights and they were up all night. Yep. Uh, so really, really happy with this improvement. All right, so um, we talked a lot about the change to aggressive reserve and calling up time and clicks for everything. Um, for the last year. So I'm not going to go into those too much, but they're up there for you if you want a refresher. Um, but what I do want to talk about is a change that we made for reserves who are given minimum call out to so that two, three hours in co-terminal to report to the airport, but it's, you know, you report and the flight has departed without you. So today these reserves get lost. Um, sometimes you, you go back on call, but you might decide to just hang out at the airport. You're next on call. Flight's going to come. Crew scheduling's going to call me. You sit around and you never hear from them again. Um, or you're like, last time I just sat around. I'm going to go home this time. As soon as you get home, they call you immediately. You have to turn around and come back. It's really frustrating for reserves um, and it's frustrating for the rest of the membership because um, losing reserves leads to an inefficient utilization of reserves, which can then lead to rescheduling of line holders because reserves aren't showing when they're available. Um, and it's just bad all around. So this is um, a better, this is an improvement because now these reserves are going to be at the airport. You're going to be on duty 
earning pay and credit towards calling out of time as a standby. It'll be for the remainder of your wrap, or if your wrap is longer than six hours, it'll just be for a six hour standby shift. And again, you're earning pay and credit, you're on duty, or you have the option to be released from the day if you ask crew scheduling to do that for you. And this is an important part of our overall goals and overall strategy to improve reserve because losing reserves leads to running out of reserves, which leads to high reserve percentages and rescheduling line holders. So better utilization is key to lowering the reserve percentages system wide, which is something that's important to all of us. All right, um, so similarly, we've talked a lot about LMCO and reserve use of TTS and UBL for the past year, so not going to go into too much about that. Um, you can always check out negotiation status if you um, want a refresher, but I do want to highlight um, something on here, which is a current practice that we have today, which is the ability to request to be released from standby or from wrap. Um, but we don't have contract language for it today, so there's sometimes misinformation about how it goes down. Um, so what we did is we just added contract language to say that you can request to be released from standby or from wrap without a loss of paying credit or a loss of guarantee. And um, <laughs> that way everybody's on the same page. All right, thank you, Reese. Uh, we have quite a few improvements there. I know you didn't talk about all of them because we've talked about those previously. Um, and we will, I just want to remind everyone also uh, that this slide deck will be out for you. You don't have to take pictures of it. You don't have to take screenshots. Um, we will put it out with our town hall so it will be available to everyone. All right, next up is our PBS improvements. And I, you know what, I, this is, and Wendy is going to talk about that today. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. Um, so one of the improvements we were able to achieve is today, if a sequence cancels and we're already bidding in PBS, um, they don't remove it um, and so it's assigned and then the uh, flight or the sequence is no longer operating. So in the future we'll have, um, they will remove those sequences um, and they will not be awarded in PBS. If for some reason they are awarded, they would be treated as a PBS miss award, which would mean you only have to uh, participate in the first TTS run once it's a determined that you were misawarded and only one run uh, for light sequences, which means domestic for domestic, IPD for IPD, um, within similar start and end times. This is a really big improvement. Yeah, I will say that, and this is something the team fought for. Um, the company, of course, did not want to agree to this, but this was definitely important, especially we've seen this recently. We saw it in Los Angeles recently. We saw it in Dallas. Um, I think it's really important uh, for our flight attendants that um, at today this does not happen. No. They just let you bid for them and then you get it and then they cancel after. Yeah, and you but, lose time yeah. and unless an LOA is signed and so yeah, it's this is huge. Yeah. So um, another improvement in PBS is speaker sequence sorting. So um, today, if you're a language qualified flight attendant, you kind of have to know what your um, destinations are that require your uh, language qualification. In the future, you will be able to sort in PBS uh, your language requirement. So you can put in Spanish and all of those sequences should populate that, sh that way you uh, know every single sequence that requires your language of uh, language qualification, which is, uh, I think, really going to help the speakers when bidding. Um, the next item is a preferred position order per aircraft. So today we only bid preferred position order, which means if you have a 777 and an Airbus and you're bidding position two, you're bidding that for both aircraft. So in the future, you're going to say on the 777, I don't want to, so I'm going to bid aisles only. But then on the Airbus, you do like position two, so you'll be able to say on this aircraft, I like position two. We um, heard from flight attendants that they wanted more layers and we did try to achieve more layers, but this was kind of the way to lessen the need for more layers, hopefully, that because you're when you were bidding, you were bidding this aircraft in positions and then having to go through and bid specific sequences and or generic sequences, but the aircraft. So it took more layers. So hopefully this will reduce the need for more layers, which the company was not interested in doing by adding more layers. 
And it would be good improvement to say at least. I think that yeah. one we've heard from from the start. Yes. Yeah. Um, the next slide. Oh. <laughs> uh, allowed double ups. So today we have allowed double ups, but on specific date only. So in the future, you'll have um, the ability to just say allow double ups in the entire month. Um, and then a uh, block of reserve days off. So you'll be able to say, I want five days off. I don't care where in the month. I just want five days off somewhere as a block. And that will be an improvement for reserves um, in bidding and PVS. So. Thank you, Wendy. Good, good improvements. Um, all right, next up is our commuter policy, which we have been working on quite a bit because um, we do have quite a few commuters here. So Kelly's going to talk to you about the changes in the commuter policy. OK, so one thing that we're going to start with is it actually is in the training section, but it does affect uh, commuters. So if you are Dallas based and either you live 50 miles away from the training facility or let's say you live down in Houston, um, when you do a training event that requires a hotel, you will be provided for one. So you get to check out the new digs there at Skyview. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we got for everyone else that does like airline commuting is we were able to secure that you can actually commute on other airlines now, um, which is a huge win. Um, and to build on that, your first flight of your commuting flight, whether it be on American or another airline, full flights are not covered in today's world, but tomorrow's world they will be. So what is a full flight? When you are checking in for your flight 24 hours in advance, if there are at least 10% of seats available, that is considered an open flight that will qualify for commuting. So anybody who's a commuter knows that 24 hours, it gets real, real quick, and usually when you're trying to go home. So, um, will be covered now, which is good. So if we could do the next slide, we can see what that would look like. OK, so it was really hard for me to find a flight with open seats, but I finally was able to find life. So on the top flight, you can see that there is well more than 10% available. So that flight would qualify for commuting. Let's say 12 hours before the flight, it completely fills up. There are no seats. And on this particular flight, it is um, regional, so there is no jump seat. But if it fills up, you are covered. So the second one flight does not have 10% available in any way, shape, or form. So that would not qualify under the commuter policy. Thanks, Kelly. All right, good improvements for our commuters. OK, next up, we're going to talk about one of the things that our flight attendants have um, definitely been unfortunately experiencing since COVID is not having a hotel when they're rescheduled or canceled. And Brian's going to update us on the changes that we made in crew accommodations. Good morning. Um, in the event of a cancellation, reschedule or other modifications that would require a hotel and the company fails to notify you of a hotel assignment within an hour of the blocking at that layover city, the company will pay 150% and credit it at 100% for the duty period preceding that layover. Now, if they continue to fail to notify you after three hours, you will be paid at the rate of 150% and credited at 100% for the entire sequence instead of just that duty period, which is a huge um, uh, gain for us. So this is a huge penalty for the company, and hopefully this will stop them from not having hotels for us because we don't want any flight attendants waiting for a hotel, especially when we've been rescheduled, right? And they've had plenty of time to get us a hotel, which is something that we're always fighting for, but this will give them a penalty if that does happen. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Okay, work-life balance increased. Uh, Flexibility, something we've heard quite a bit from our flight attendants. So Tim's going to talk to you about what we've done with TTS. So we've heard the frustration from many flight attendants over how difficult it is at TTS to drop and trade trade trips due to the open time being at the uh, at or over the limit of the three percent. So this is why you see that all familiar phrase of daily or monthly open time exceeded in the results column. Um, that said, there has to be some guardrails in TTS to uh, for dropping and trading. Um, this company has to ensure that they have adequate coverage throughout the month. So, for instance, they're not going to let everyone that has a weekend trip 
uh, trade those trips for trips that begin at the beginning of the week, right? Because that would leave all, uh, the weekend without adequate coverage. Um, and they have to ensure that they can cover the operation. So this is where those daily and monthly limits come into play. We do get a lot of questions about why don't we just raise the 3%? Um, so we, it's important to understand that that 3% um, is directly proportionate to the number of reserves needed to cover that open time. So while we could increase the 3%, it's just gonna mean we need that many more reserves to cover the operation. Um, and one thing we have heard loud and clear from the membership is that they, they want the numbers of reserves lowered, not increased. Um, so that's why we don't go that, down that route. Um, to increase flexibility with trading in T TTS, we were able to secure an exception to those daily limits. Now for transactions which would improve a more negative day. So uh, what is a negative day? So think of a negative day as a day where there's poor coverage. So trading for a more negative day would be trading for a day that the coverage is worse. So we have a slide that's coming up next, which we can illustrate just how that's gonna work. It is uh, kind of a basic example. So when you look at this, this graphic, you can see Monday through uh, Sunday, those 5%, 4%, 9%, 10%, that represents the amount of open time. So all of those days are either at or over the 3%, maximum. So in today's world, you can see if I want to trade my sequence on Monday, Tuesday, open time is already at 5% on both of those days. The trade, the trip I want to pick up or trade for is on Thursday, Friday, and those days are also over the 3% at 9%. So in today's world, if you try to put that through, it's going to deny it. You're going to get that message that says daily monthly limit, uh, open time limit exceeded. So it's not going to go through. This exception that we've secured is going to look at the open time from the trip I'm dropping and compare it to the open time from the trip I'm picking up. As long as the trip I'm dropping is less than the trip I'm picking up, the trade should go through. So you can see coverage is bad on the days of my trip, but it's worse on the days that I'm picking up. So by me trading, is actually helping uh, that coverage situation. So um, that said, we're very pleased about this. It's going to help with improving flexibility for our flight attendants, and it should mean a lot more transactions being processed. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. I think that was, I think this is one of the things I hear the most from our flight attendants today, especially since after COVID, it seems that um, they, our flight attendants aren't seeing as much trading that they had prior to COVID. And so we hope definitely, not hope, we know that this will help with the trades. And one, one thing that we should mention too, that there's some confusion is about neutral trades, which they, they do go through today. So if you have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday trip, and you're trading for another Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday trip, the exact same calendar days has to be the same duration and the exact same dates. Those trades do go through, even, even though the open time limits are either at or above, as long as it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, third, fourth, fifth, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, third, fourth, fifth, those transactions do go through, but they have to be in the same ballot. You can't have a separate drop and a separate pickup. It's got to be a trade in the same ballot. Those do go through today. Thanks, Tim. Okay, next up, we've made some changes in the foreign language speaker section of our contract, and Susan's going to walk us through those. So just a little bit of background on where how we got to where we are today. We had previously had a tentative agreement for Section 15. In that agreement, there was no reduction to the number of speakers on the aircraft from the current JCBA language. The change was how you got your position on the flight, and it would be assigned per flight versus per cabin, which is current. That change recognized and seniority of all flight attendants on that flight, speaker and non-speaker, when assigning the cabin position. Soon after we had that TA, the company came out and let us know that they were reconfiguring some aircraft, taking out the first class cabin and creating a much larger business class. So we wanted to address that change and the section was looked at again and opened and we modified our proposal to address those changes on having a larger business class cabin. So we do have a new tentative agreement now. 
we want to make it clear that the total number of speakers in the tentative agreement has not been reduced from the current JCBA language. What has changed and to address the uh, increased business class was on aircraft with fewer than 50 business class seats, the speakers required can be in any cabin. On aircraft with 50 or more business class seats, premium seats, the speakers will be per cabin, which is current JCB language. So if we look at the slide, for example, on the 777-300, the speaker staffing will not change from the current per cabin because the premium cabin has more than 50 business class seats. The same with the new 787P, it's a new aircraft we're going to see next year. The speaker staffing will be per cabin because the premium cabin has more than 50 seats. On the 787-9, the staffing will change to speakers per flight because it has a business class cabin with less than 50 seats. And the same will be true for the 787-9 because it does has less than 50 business class seats. Thanks, hey, Susan. Um, I know that there's been a lot of information out there about this and I think one of the things that we've seen the most um, and that we've heard from our speakers is they thought that we reduced mm -hmm. the number of speakers on our flights and that is not true. It's the same as it is today. There's been no reduction in the number of speakers per flight. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, those are the uh, those are the improvements that we wanted to go through with you first, and then we are still. Oh, I am so sorry, I forgot we have one more slide. All right, Tim. <laughs> yeah, we just, wanted to, we just wanted to walk through the uh, improvements that were already secured in the foreign language speaker section. Um, we were able to lower the occupational seniority requirement when uh, for those language resignation proffers from ten years down to seven years. Uh, I think Wendy already spoke about the ability to sort sequences in PBS by language when doing your bidding. Um, we also improved, uh, we have improved how speakers are going to be allocated for wraps. This should better align the number of speakers to the number of trips that uh, are open in uh, those individual wraps. So there's no need to have 30 speakers on wrap C when there's only two trips that require a language going out during that wrap. So that hopefully this better aligns that. And we still have outstanding proposals in the economic section to increase the speaker pay, as well as uh, an introduction of an understaffing pay component for speakers, which would go by the bid complement. So if the, if the sequence had two speakers in, the, in bidding and only one speaker showed up on the plane, that speaker would get the pay for both speakers. So we're hoping that we can secure those for you. Thanks, Tim. All right. So we are not done yet, but we are getting very close. And we do have some key um, items that we are still fighting for. And we wanted to list those out for you here today. You have received all of these in hotlines before. Also, um, they are on our website. So we just wanted to kind of outline it here for you so you can see that we are still fighting for these issues. We're not going to get into discussing all each issue because we have discussed them before in our previous town halls, also uh, on the website. So just wanted you to have this information and we will keep fighting for these. Next, I, we want to talk and we're about up with our time. We're about uh, this town hall is about ready to be at one hour. We didn't want to keep you much longer than that. But we do want to talk a little bit about our CEO and the 2.75 million bonus that he just received. He got that bonus and we are still here waiting for a contract four years, nine months and 28 days later. We deserve an industry leading contract. We will take nothing less. We are not putting out anything less to the flight attendants at American Airlines. We work for the world's largest airline and we are the largest work group at that airline. And we will not take concessions. You have our word on this. What can you do? How can you help us? You helped us tremendously with your strike vote. That was very helpful, but it is also please stay up to date, stay informed, read the negotiation hotlines, make sure that you wear your red pin, your red war pin and your lanyard every time you come to work. 
come to the union, look at your website and the hotlines for this information. Make sure you get the facts about negotiations and make sure that is all that you are that you are uh, out there talking about, not things that you heard from someone that aren't true. Okay, stay informed. You can also help us by showing up every time we have a picket. When we ask you to send an email to one of management, such as maybe our CEO, uh, um, and telling them that you deserve a contract, make sure you participate. These are all very important. We are also going to make our red shirts that we all have on today available to all of you. And you will see a hotline very soon that you can come to the APFA website and you can order a shirt. And if you want me with like a pin, a red war pin, we have other pins right now also that we've started. Um, we have one for October for breast cancer awareness um, and we have many others. So we will have those all there for you. We will have that out for you very soon and we will send those to you. You are the members, this is your union, and we wanna make sure that if you wanna wear a red APFA t-shirt on your layover, and you want people to be talking to you about what's going on in our contract, you have one of those, or it's CQ, another really great place, thank you, Josh, um, to wear your red APFA t-shirt. So um, we will have a hotline out very soon about that. And we wanna thank you so much, number one, for showing up, for showing up for that strike authorization vote, for showing up at the pickets, and sending a very clear, loud message to this management team that you will take nothing less than an industry-leading contract and you will not take any concessions. We heard you, they heard you, and it is time that we get this done. So thank you so much for joining us today. We will have another town hall when we have something to share with you. Um, and of course, we will have more negotiation hotlines and we will update the website um, as soon as we possibly can. So thank you again, and it's time to get this done. We are ready. We are ready. Definitely.